it's possible that our program tonight is, happen is happening simultaneously in another universe, perhaps in many other universes. Uh, we're all very fortunate that Dr. Max Tegmark, one of the world's leading physicists, is here to explain why and how that might be so. Leaving behind his childhood in Sweden, Max Tegmark traveled to a warmer climate for grad school, settling into the University of California at Berkeley. That sounds great right now. Uh, it was a perfect environment for intellectual adventure, and he became known as Mad Max because of his unorthodox ideas about the nature of reality and the existence of multiple universes. Dr. Tegmark moved from California to Princeton and then to MIT, and along the way and over the years, his way out theories became not so way out as other cosmologists stuck their toes into the world of the multiverse. We're thrilled Max is here to tell us about his quest for the ultimate nature of reality and his complex theory about the multiverse. And hopefully we will understand his idea that, I quote, get ready. We're on a planet in a galaxy in a universe that I think is in a doppelganger laden level one multiverse in a more diverse level two multiverse in a quantum mechanical level three multiverse in a level four multiverse of all mathematical structures." End quote. Uh, <laughs> I say that all the time. Uh, please, <laughs> please join me in giving a warm welcome to Max Tegmark. Thank you so much. That's a hard act to follow. <laughs> it's a, it's a, such, a, such a pleasure and a treat to be here tonight. The, uh, now that you've heard all these incriminating things about me, let me ask you just a little bit about you first. Who here, if, does anyone have any affiliations to MIT? Raise your hand. Oh, we have some wolves in sheep's clothes. <laughs> Anybody who uh, does any kind of work or teaching to do with math or physics? Raise your hand. Oh, a lot of wolves. It's a tough audience. But this is actually the toughest audience I've ever spoken in front of about this book because tonight I even have my own children, Philip and Alexander, here, who are always my harshest <laughs> critics. Thank you. And their great friends, Katie and Robert, as well have turned out. So I better be on my best behavior. I really want to encourage you all to think big. Because we humans have again and again and again underestimated not only the size of our cosmos, discovering that everything we thought existed is just a small part of a much grander structure a planet, a solar system, a galaxy, a universe, and maybe even a hierarchy of parallel universes. But we've also repeatedly underestimated the power of our human minds to understand our cosmos. And through understanding it, even develop technologies which can help make life better for us. And um, to appreciate what I mean by saying that things have turned out to be bigger th than, than we thought, we first need to remind ourselves of what we humans have figured out so far about our place in space. So let's begin in the Himalayas and uh, head up into our cosmos. Now, cave-dwelling ancestors who lived here long ago, they also, of course, looked at the stars, these twinkling objects up there, and had all these myths for what they thought what these were. And I think they were just as smart as us. But, uh, many of them probably... Um, Felt a little bit melancholy, though, feeling that you know we would never, they would never really know what those stars were because they couldn't, we could never touch them, never go there. But they underestimated the power of our human minds because now we know a great deal about what's out there, and uh, we didn't even need rocket power to figure these things out. We just needed mental power to let our minds fly. Two thousand years ago, for example, er in ancient Greece, Eratosthenes figured out the size of our planet to be forty thousand kilometers around just from clever observations of shadows and angles. And uh, you can see here how these, this kind of cleverness led to rocket power. In green, you see all the satellite orbits of nearby satellites, and then blue, geostationary, farther out satellites that we've put up there. Everything here is accurate and to scale, thanks to the, this nice animation made by the American Museum of Natural History in New York. So when you look at the moon, for instance, its orbit, you don't even see the moon like you would if it were a kid's book, because it's to scale. And when the planetary orbits come into view, you won't see the planets either. So that's how big the orbits actually are when you do it to scale. And just to remind ourselves of how big this is, you all know it takes about eight minutes for light to reach us from the sun. It takes a few hours for light to get to us from the outer parts of our solar system. Yet, 
I'd like you to raise your hands if you know anybody who was born before 1925. Yeah. Think about these people, what kind of universe they grew up in. They didn't know that there were other galaxies because that was only settled in 1925 by Edwin Hubble, who realized and demonstrated for the first time that these big nebulous blobs in the sky were actually other galaxies, just like the Milky Way, which we know now is our home, with hundreds of billions of, of stars in it, stretching 100,000 light years from side to side. And yet, we now know, of course, also that this, too, is just a small part of an even grander structure. We have galaxies forming groups, clusters, super clusters, enormous filaments. And soon coming into focus here, you can see the Sloan Great Wall, which I and my colleagues from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey discovered, which stretches about a billion light years from side to side. So this is really, really vast stuff that we've mapped out. Yet this, too, is only part of something even bigger, what we affectionately know as our universe, which is now arriving to its a stage near you, thanks to my wife. Thank you, Maya. <laughs> when we talk about our universe, we don't as I thought when I was a kid, taught me everything that exists. R rather, in, in astronomy, by our universe, we simply mean this. We mean the spherical region of space from which light has had time to reach us so far during the 13.8 billion years since our Big Bang, because that's the most we can ever see, no matter how fancy telescopes we build. To see galaxies that are farther away than this, we, we would have to wait billions of years longer for the light to eventually reach us. So this is where we're limited to seeing, like it or not. Now, most of what I said and showed here was pretty intuitive. When you fly farther away, you see more stuff. But what is the deal with all this yellow and green weird coloring on the, on the sphere? What's that? To appreciate that, it's not enough to talk about our place in space. We also have to explore our place in time. Now, fortunately, this is quite straightforward in astronomy because, we, as we already discussed, the sky is like a time machine. When we look at the sun, we don't see it now, we see it eight minutes ago. If you look at stars tonight, if you can see any, you might see things that happened hundreds of years ago. So if there is someone out there, they won't see us at the Museum of Science, they might see the Boston Tea Party. And uh, when we look at a really awesome telescope image like this, we can see many galaxies the way they were, not hundreds of years ago, but billions and billions of years ago. And by looking at dist different distances, can see all the different stages of cosmic history and try to piece, out, piece together what actually happened in our universe during the 13.8 billion years since our Big Bang. So what have we learned from looking at these kind of images of the sky? We've learned something really surprising. And to appreciate how surprising it is, I want you for a moment to imagine that each one of you is a galaxy. And I'm looking out at you galaxies with my telescope. And I notice, hmm, this is really weird. All of you guys in the front row here seem to be about 90 years old. <laughs> Sorry, no offense. <laughs> uh, you look very healthy, though. <laughs> and then we have a bunch of 80-year-olds, and then a bunch of 70-year-olds and 60-year-olds. And farther up in the back, I see a whole row there with just teenagers. And then uh, a bunch of toddlers. And the second last row, see only infants. You're such an <laughs> intellectual town here in Boston. You saw all these precocious people coming to science lectures. The last, lect the last row of all, is completely empty. And as if that weren't weird enough, that you guys all just sorted yourself by age when you walked in, strangely, the back wall of the theater here is glowing with microwaves at us. And it gets worse, weirder still, because you're all blushing. You guys in the front, you're just a little bit pink. Those of you in the back, you're like positively tomato red in the face. This is exactly what it actually looks like when we look at the galaxies out there. And why? What do we make of this? Well, the part about you guys strangely having arranged yourself by how old you are, we can understand from what we just discussed. The, the farther away I look, right, the farther into the past I'm looking, because it's taken light so long to reach me from you. So if I'm here, nearby, I see things which happened pretty recently. I see galaxies which have had a long time to grow up and mature and get big. Farther away, I see basically just baby galaxies because I'm looking at our cosmos when it was so young, the galaxies hadn't had time to grow and develop and mature. And when I look really far away, corresponding to the last room of the theater here, I see no galaxies at all. 
because I'm looking at our universe when it was so young that galaxies just hadn't had time to get born yet. All we had back then was the material out of which the galaxies later formed, namely mostly hydrogen gas. Now, why were you guys all blushing? Were you embarrassed? Was it something I said? The, uh, something we've learned, which you can see in the museum exhibits out here, is that if you go down to the highway and you listen to cars, they'll go, ew, ew. They do not sound, mm, mm, right? They go, ew, because when the car goes away from us, the frequency gets lowered, the Doppler effect, right? And exactly the same thing happens with light. If a galaxy is flying away from us, the frequency of the light gets lower, which means the color of the light gets redder. We call it red shifting. So the fact that you guys are all blushing means that you galaxies must all be flying away from me. This is what we mean when we say that our universe is expanding. We can figure out, if I look at any one of you galaxies, Mary, for example, if I want to figure out how long ago were you here, I just look at how fast you're moving away. I, I take, look at the distance to you. I take the distance divided by the speed. It tells me how long ago you were here. I, I can do it a bit more accurately by figuring out how fast you're accelerating and decelerating. And I get about 13.8 billion years ago. Now, the remarkable thing is I get the same answer pretty much for all of you guys. Those of you who are twice as far away as Mary are actually blushing much more. You're moving, if you're twice as far away, you're moving away about twice as fast. So you're also here at the same time. About 13.8 billion years ago, as far as we can tell, pretty much everything was on top of everything else in a giant calamity. We don't know exactly what happened here, but we have a fancy sounding name for it, our Big Bang, right? And we can come back and talk about it later in more detail. What we do know with great precision now, though, is what actually happened during the 13.8 billion years since our Big Bang. And that can help us understand the last weird thing I just mentioned, that the whole back wall of the theater is glowing at us with microwaves. What's with that? Well, if everything is flying apart and expanding, well, then so is the gas here. And if you take gas and you expand it, it cools off. That's how your refrigerators and air conditioners work. So if we go backward, the gas is more and more squished together, which means it's hotter and hotter. If you take a... If you take some ice here and you heat it up, it turns into liquid from solid. If you take a liquid and heat it up, it turns into gas, steam, right? If I turn, if I take some gas and I heat it up more, what, only kids can answer this now. What does it turn into? Yes, Robert. Plasma. Plasma. Awesome. Go Winchester. School system. Great. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we, I actually was dis discovered we have another wolf in sheep's clothes, a Winchester teacher sitting up in the back, too. So. Uh, you've done a good job. Now, so that can help us answer the puzzle because all this gas once was so hot that it was a plasma. Now, a plasma is actually not transparent like the air here. It's opaque. So it looks to us like beyond all these galaxies is an op opaque plasma screen. But, of course, it's going to look the same in whatever direction we look with our telescopes. Sufficiently far away, you're looking so far back in time that the, all the gas was hot enough to be a plasma. So it actually looks to us like we're surrounded by a plasma sphere that we can photograph from the inside. For many years, people were trying, trying to take pictures of this stuff, and it was just too hard. We finally got some really awesome pictures of it in 1992, which got the Nobel Prize. And now we have even nicer pictures here on the edge of our universe here, which you're welcome to play with as long as you're gentle and loving with it. <laughs> and uh, these plasma, these photos of this plasma screen are from so far away that they're showing what our universe was like when it was only 400,000 years old. And this has really revolutionized cosmology, this kind of data. I have had a huge amount of fun working with it myself, with my colleagues, to try to figure out what it means. And um, it does beg the question, though, if this was so hard, how do we know we didn't screw up and the, the, the photos aren't wrong somehow? Well, fortunately, an even more ambitious experiment than the NASA satellite WMAP that took these photos just released even better pictures last year, the Planck satellite, going from this image with 3 megapixels to this image with 50 megapixels. And you can see how incredibly well they agree. Look at any little spot. It's still there, except now you have an even sharper image 
which gives us even more amazing information about our, our baby universe. So in summary, cosmology has been an amazing field in recent years. When I started in grad school, we argued about whether our universe was 10 or 20 billion years old. Now we argue about whether it's 13.7 or 13.8 billion years old. Why? It's not because we're any smarter. It's because we have gotten all this amazing data which technology has brought us. So we've come a long way. But let's be humble now. Huge mysteries remain. Every time we've answered questions like the age of our universe, new ones pop up. For example, we've discovered, as many of you have heard, that 95% of the stuff in our universe, we still have no clue what it is. And worse, we know that there are actually at least two different kinds of substances we don't know what they are. Dark matter, making up about 24%, and then dark energy, making up about 69%. We can talk more about this afterwards, but we would really love to know what this kind of what this stuff is. We would lo also love to know what's going to happen in the distant future of our cosmos. And it turns out that the answer to that is basically the same question as what dark energy is, because the dark energy is going to call the shots and determine whether our universe will expand forever or come crashing back on itself in a big crunch or end with death bubbles or a big rip or a big snap or something else. And we would also like to know more about what really happened early on. You know, there's no shortage of, of mysteries left in cosmology. So the younger part of the audience, if you study science, uh, maybe you can be the ones who, who figure this out with all the better data we're getting. So, so what kind of better data can we get? After all, we've mapped the edges of our universe, which is as far as we can see. So are, isn't it like game over? No, actually. Let me show you how little we've accomplished. Let's peel off the surface of this. Don't do it with <laughs> the actual <laughs> balloon I reach ball I gave you here. And look inside. So you can see these photos are just photographing what's shown, what I show in yellow here. Very small fraction of the total volume. And that Sloan Digital Sky Survey galaxy map I flew you around in there, the most ambitious galaxy mapping project so far, is just this puny stuff in the middle here. L again, less than a percent of the volume. So most of this is still uncharted territory. It's kind of like in the early days of, the, of America when we, we knew a lot about what was on the East Coast, a little bit on the West Coast because Sp the Spanish had sailed there. We were pretty clueless about the interior. You know, so we had to launch the Lewis and Clark expedition and all sorts of stuff to figure out here. And this is where we are now. How can you map more of this stuff? You cannot ever see a bunch of galaxies out here with telescopes because there are none to see. This is so far back in time that they haven't f formed yet, right? So it seems like we're hosed, but we're not. Because it turns out that all this hydrogen gas that was out there can also be seen with radio telescopes. Because hydrogen gas gives off radio waves. They're about 21 centimeters long when they're given off. And they're stretched by the expansion of our universe so that by the time they reach Earth, they're much longer. And how long they are, tell us how far into the past they were emitted. So we can actually reconstruct from this three-dimensional maps of all the blobs of hydrogen out there that later formed galaxies, in principle. It's very hard to do, though, because the signal is very faint. And nobody has succeeded in doing it yet. So there's a, a number of teams around the planet racing and competing to be the first to do this. So of course, we at MIT decided to join this race. For f and uh, let me show you how easy it is to build a radio telescope and how you can actually do it in just two minutes flat.
easy, wasn't it? <laughs> well, you should particularly applaud for Philip and Alexander and Maya who are sitting here because they helped build it there. They were running around so fast you didn't recognize them. And uh, it's been it's just so much fun to uh, get to work on this project because there's just so many awesome uh, people I get to work with. It, that's one of the great joys of, of, of being a scientist. You also notice that that didn't look at all like uh, our SIBO radio telescope that was in the movie GoldenEye with just a giant dome like this. That's because with modern technology, we don't need to have big, these bi build these big clunky dishes that are super expensive to have motors to point anymore. We can actually just uh, buy a large number of very cheap to mass produce antennas, and put them out over a big field, just measure the volts coming from the sky with all the different antennas, and put all these volts together into some really high powered computing equipment and just figure out with a computer what our universe looks like. So it's an all digital telescope concept with no moving parts. And uh, that turns out to be way, way cheaper to build. And also has the advantage that whereas an ordinary telescope can only look at one part of the sky at a time, and then you have to keep moving it, this actually lets you fit, look at the entire sky all the time. It's omnidirectional, which is why we call it the omniscope, which is what my students are trying to spell here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so right now, as you saw, I've, we've teamed up with a bunch of other radio astronomy groups from across the US to build the world's biggest thing of this kind, which should be powerful enough to actually really start seeing this signal well and make the largest maps of our universe in three dimensions ever, which we're super excited about. Now, so in summary, w what I've told you about is two themes. Right? We have consistently underestimated how big our cosmos is, but we've also consistently underestimated the power of our human minds to understand it. And that raises the question, oh, why is that? How is it that we humans have been able to figure out so much more than we once thought we could about the world? Uh, partly it's, of course, because the human mind just turned out to be even more versatile and amazing than we thought. Think about it. We didn't evolve to be able to read or write or do most of the things we do, right? Yet we can, so that's pretty remarkable. And as far as we know, the human brain is the most complex object in our universe. The sun is much bigger, yes, but it's vastly simpler. But that's still not the whole story. I also think this is telling us something not just about us, but about nature. But what is it telling us? Well, we've discovered that nature comes with these remarkable clues built into it, these mathematical clues in the form of patterns and regularities that we can capture with, with mathematical equations. And what science has been so successful in doing is basically implementing two ideas. The first one being do experiments. And the second being when you've made experiments, take your measurements and try to describe them with mathematical equations. It's just magically worked again and again and again. And we often forget to ask, why is it? It's kind of like, it's easy to get, if somebody is spoiling us, we might start taking for granted that we just get all these gifts all the time. We scientists have gotten kind of spoiled by mother nature and forgotten to ask, or, or it's just, we're just taking for granted that we'll find more and more clues all the time. But why is this? Many people have wondered for a very long time, in fact, over 2,000 years ago, Pythagoras exclaimed that our that numbers appear to rule the universe. And uh, during the Renaissance, Galileo said that our universe seems to be a book really written in the language of mathematics. But what are they talking about? Where is all this math that they're mentioning? I mean, I look around in the room here, I don't see any numbers at all except it says 729 out there, but that obviously isn't anything very fundamental about our universe since we humans <laughs> put that there. Uh, so, so what is this math? Well, we can see that although many people think of math as just a bag of tricks for manipulating numbers, or maybe as my mom, I uh, think of it as a sadistic form of torture invented by school teachers to make <laughs> us feel bad about ourselves. That's not how Galileo thinks about it. He's talking about math more broadly here, right, as geometrical shapes and patterns as well. And indeed, in modern math, there's, it's, it's, there's so much geometry and other abstract ideas that you, you can sometimes read a whole book on math that doesn't have any numbers in it at all except the page numbers. And patterns and shapes, that is definitely something we see around us in the, in the world, right? For example, if you throw something up so it just moves under the influence of gravity, it always goes in the same shape. What do we call this? A parabola. Exactly. It obeys this very simple equation, y equals x squared. 
if you have something moving under gravity in space, again, it always goes in the same shape, which we call an ellipse, exactly, which again obeys a very simple equation. And in, in fact, these two shapes are also related because a small piece of a parabola, a small piece of an ellipse is well approximated by an, an ellipse. And if you redo this high school math problem that gave you the parabola and you do it more carefully, you find that it's actually not going on a parabola but on a little piece of a very skinny ellipse. So everything goes in these ellipses. And um, let me give you a qu pop quiz. This is a very bad habit I have as a professor. <laughs> so it won't count towards your final grade, don't worry. It's just a diagnostic. Here are three, cool, three discoveries. The planet Neptune, the radio wave, and the discovery of the Higgs boson. What tool was it that, tri that triggered these discoveries, these things? A little bit louder, please. Telescope. telescope. Actually, that's a good guess, but actually the planet Uranus was discovered with a telescope, but Neptune was actually predicted without the telescope. Does anyone want to do some more guessing? Math. Math. Mathematics. Exactly. So it turns out that when people study the this planet Uranus that had just been discovered, they realized it was not moving quite according to the equations of Newton's gravity that it was supposed to move along. And um, this French astronomer, Urban Leverrier, did a bunch of calculations, 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 and then he took his math, he wrote a letter to an astronomer named Gall in Berlin and said, point your telescope to such and such a place in the sky at such and such a time, and you will there find a new planet. So that when Gall got this letter, I don't know what he thought. Maybe he figured that this Frenchman was cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. <laughs> but, but he was clearly curious enough that he, he still tried. He pointed his telescope there, and boom, there was Neptune predicted with math, or if you want to be a real stickler, no, with a pencil. <laughs> Just a few decades later, James Clerk Maxwell was studying electromagnetism and found that he could unify everything that was known about, a, about that into these four equations, Maxwell's equations, which is what I just started teaching my, my a course about at MIT yesterday morning. And uh, he solved these equations doing a bunch of calculations, and made another prediction that if you build a certain kind of device, you can use it to send information at the speed of light through empty space or through walls. And uh, raise your hand if you have a cell phone in your pocket. So again, pr this was predicted through math. And most recently, Peter Higgs took the most advanced mathematical description of the world we have, the so-called standard model of particle physics. He calculated, calculated, calculated with mathematics and predicted that if we humans go ahead and build the most advanced scientific instrument ever built in Geneva, and we crash there to use it to crash together particles near the speed of light, we will there discover a new particle called the Higgs boson. You know what happened? We built it, there it was, and he won a free trip to my hometown of Stockholm. <laughs> so math has again and again and again proven super powerful in physics, and we can now summarize things in not just one set of equations like this, but we have, my, my wife and kids have to endure it, having this in the living room, <laughs> <laughs> poor things. Uh, they, they basically all of the knowledge of physics can be condensed into a very, very small and compact description like this. Some people take it even further than the living room and put e equations on their tombstone. It's really remarkable, and it's not just shapes and patterns and equations either that show that there's mathematics at some level in nature, but it's even numbers. So in the, in the book, Our Mathematical Universe, you'll find this table with 32 numbers in it, pure numbers with no units or anything like this. And from only these 32 numbers, we f physicists can in principle calculate every other fundamental physical constant ever measured in the history of science. You can measure 100,000 different numbers to do with what colors of light come out of different kinds of atoms, and you can calculate them all from this. Pick any other question. You want to know why is it that the proton is 1,836 times heavier than the electron? You can calculate it from these numbers. It's, it's really quite remarkable. And it, it begs the question, now why is this? What I've, everything I've said so far is fairly uncontroversial. Math is super useful in science. But why? By the 1960s, the famous physicist Eugene Wigner was so weirded out by this that he, he said that the enormous usefulness of math in the natural sciences was really something bordering on the mysterious, and there was this no rational explanation for it. 
So in the book, I explore the whole range of possibilities here, from the possibility that there is no explanation or it's just a fluke and it doesn't really mean anything, to the opposite extreme on the spectrum, that maybe there is actually a very profound explanation for it. Maybe this is really telling us something about nature. Maybe it's actually telling us that nature really is profoundly mathematical. And I explore the idea that nature, our universe, isn't just described by math, but that it is math in the sense that it's a mathematical structure, which I talk about in detail in the book, what I mean by it. In, in plain English, it basically boils down to saying that our world doesn't just have some mathematical properties, like the ones we've talked about during the past five, 10 minutes, but that it has only mathematical properties. And this sounds really weird, but we know in math that uh, very often we can take some complicated math and approximate it by some simpler math. So if what I'm saying is actually correct, then what we physicists have been unwittingly doing the whole time is we've found more and more accurate mathematical approximations to the correct math, which we haven't discovered yet, because we're still struggling to, to, to unify gravitation with quantum mechanics and stuff like this. Now, to further appreciate just how weird it is, this idea that nature has only mathematical properties, I want to introduce you to Mr. Hoggles. <laughs> so Mr. Hoggles is a groundhog. He lives in our backyard, <laughs> although I think he thinks that we live in his backyard. And uh, if you look at him, I mean, what properties does Mr. Hoggles have? Cuteness, I would agree. Anything else? What did you say? A little bit louder? Cuteness we got, yeah? A little bit louder? A prognostication abilities, maybe, yeah. Uh, herbivorousness, maybe, penchant for digging holes, uh, passion for grass eating. A lot of properties, fluffiness, maybe. But this doesn't feel like mathematical properties at all. Rectangular. <laughs> Although, saying that he's rectangular feels a bit like this engineering joke when you, you say, let's assume that this, is a, this cow is spherically symmetric. I don't know if Mr. Hoggles would like this so much. However, if we look more closely at Mr. Hoggles as scientists, we see that he is actually, like everything else in our universe, made up of these elementary particles, like quarks and electrons. And what properties does an electron actually have? When I was a little kid, I had seen these like molecular building block things. I thought electrons were green balls <laughs> made out of plastic. But now, as a physicist, we've studied them in great detail we've discovered that actually electrons don't have any color at all. They don't have any texture, they don't have any smell, they don't have any of the normal properties we associate with you know, stuff. In fact, the only properties the electron has, as far as we know, are minus one, one half, a one, and so on. And although we scientists have made up these nerdy names for these properties, like electric charge, and spin, and lepton number, the electron doesn't care what we call these properties, they're just mathematical properties, and as far as we can tell, neither the electron nor any of the other particles that make up everything in our world here have any properties at all, except these mathematical properties. So they are mathematical objects in that sense, but their only properties, as far as we can tell, are, are mathematical. Now, if that goes for all the stuff in space, that like Legos you know, make up everything around us, what about space itself? What properties does space have? It has the property three. That's the largest number of fingers I can hold perpendicular to one another, right? Again, we scientists have come up with a geeky name for that. We call it the, the, yeah, the dimensionality of space. So, but again, space doesn't care. The prop, what we call the property, and that's just a human invention. The property itself is just the number three. Einstein discovered space also has these other properties called curvature and topology which are, again, purely mathematical properties. And uh, if, we, if we then willing to consider the possibility that both space itself and everything in space is purely mathematical in the sense that it has only mathematical properties, then it starts to sound a little bit less insane that maybe everything in our world is purely mathematical. Now, to summarize, I've talked about two themes here both saying that we humans are the masters of underestimation. We have repeatedly underestimated the size of our physical world, and we've also repeatedly underestimated the power of our human minds to understand it. So what does this all mean? Some people find it depressing 
that the world is so big, because somehow it suggests that we are smaller, lot smaller than all there is. To me, that's not a depressing thought. To me, that's an inspiring thought, actually, because when we discover that reality is bigger, that to me means we just have more opportunities for life. If I were stuck on a shipwrecked on a little island, I would be very happy the next day when the sun rises to see that this <laughs> island is a big island rather than you know 50 yards across. And we've come to, f so I'm very happy that we live in a big universe with a lot of opportunities for us down the road. I also think it's very inspiring though that we've been able to really understand much more about nature than we thought. And uh, if you look towards the future of physics and ask what this means, I think that, would, that means this, is this idea that it's all mathematical is actually very optimistic. Because if I'm wrong about this, and uh, there are some non-mathematical properties of nature, then eventually we're going to bump up against that roadblock. There will be just no more clues for us to find in this detective quest to understand the physical world better. And we'll be forever stuck. But if it's all mathematical, that means we might not be smart enough to find all the mathematical clues or to figure out what they mean, but they're there. And our ultimate ability to uh, understand our cosmos is only going to be limited by our own creativity and imagination. And I think that will be awesome. For example, one thing we totally don't understand now is consciousness. It's one of the things which still seem, seems to have stumped the physical sciences quite a bit. But who knows? There are actually pe we, uh, people who, even here, are hoping that this can one day be, be understood um, through the methods of science. I, if it's all mathematical, then ultimately there's hope to understand this too. Maybe as, as particles moving around and, and beautifully complex patterns in, in space and time that process information somehow, much like inside of a, of a computer game. And I, I just came back from a conference that I was organizing in Puerto Rico where we had some amazing neuroscientists who came, like Giulio Tononi and, and Christoph Koch, who are exploring exactly that hypothesis. They have this vision that, that consciousness is the way information feels when it's being processed in certain complicated ways, and that the reason that you can feel love and the, and the color red and the fragrance of your favorite ice cream has to do with certain mathematical shapes to do with, with the information processing in, in our minds. We, we don't know yet, of course, whether any of this is going to pan out or not, but um, time will tell. It's going to be very exciting to see, I think. Now, finally, I want to just spend the remaining minutes of this, of our time together here, by bringing this back to home and say, what does this mean for the future, not of our universe or physics, but for the future of us, for the future of humanity? So, you're going down this path together. What's around the corner? We used to think that you know, 50 years, 100 years, 1,000 years was a really long time. Now we know we have much more opportunities than that, right? There could be this planet is going to continue sticking around for much, much, much longer than this. We might have billions of years. What are we going to do with it? You have all read and seen movies with various speculations and visions for, for our future. And there's a wide range, of course. On one hand, you have people who are very optimistic and say, you know, there's nothing in the laws of nature that prevent life to from even spreading from our planet and making more and more of our universe come alive one day. Then you also have a lot more dystopic visions of the future, right? There are many ways we could actually wipe ourselves out with this technology we've developed, which is a double-edged sword. We might have an accidental nuclear war. We might invent super intelligent mach computers and machines. Some people think that would be awesome. Other people think it would not be so awesome. Um, <laughs> and there are a lot more realistic ways in which this could go wrong than <laughs> and in certain bad movies as well. Um, <laughs> and then, then there are, of course, many other ways in which we might, be mes might mess up our, our planet also. So I talk in that last part of my book about these challenges that we face. And what's very interesting, I think, is that when you take all these challenges, all the ways in which we could get wiped out, and you organize them by how far into the future they are most likely to wipe us out, what you find is that all of the risks that are most urgent, that have the potential to wipe us out the soonest, are actually risks that we cannot blame Mother Nature on for. We can only blame ourselves. Because these are all problems caused by technology that we humans have created. Right? But turning this around, you can also take it as encouraging, because it means that if we can get our act together and avoid wiping ourselves out, we have much more time 
to deal with the various challenges that, that our universe has posed for us. And if you ask me later during the question session, I can, I can actually tell you about some really exciting technical solutions for how to deal with the fact that the sun is going to evaporate the Atlantic Ocean in a billion years <laughs> or, the, or kill our asteroid impacts. I can tell you about how we have a very good shot at actually dealing with these problems as long as we can deal with a problem which is our own stupidity. So the, 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 the second character flaw I have as a professor, aside from an urge to give pop quizzes all the time, like they already inflicted on you, is this urge to always give grades left, right, and center. So I decided to give a grade to humanity for risk management one-on-one. <laughs> and uh, I asked around, and some friends told me, hey, maybe a B-plus would be a good grade, because yes, you know, we humans have done some pretty reckless stuff, like the Cuban Missile Crisis, which is, you know, things like this, which are kind of like playing Russian roulette, right? But hey, so that we shouldn't get an A. But hey, we're still around. It's not bad. Maybe a B plus. But I actually decided to give a D minus, <laughs> even though at MIT we c there is no such grade. <laughs> but I thought D wasn't low enough. And, and you should know I'm known as a very lenient grader at MIT as well. So why did I decide to do that? Such a low grade. Well, if you ask, what is the probability that we're going to wipe ourselves out in any given decade? You know, it's, we have really no idea. Some people think, oh, it's very unlikely, maybe a thousand, maybe a hundredth of a percent per decade. Others think more likely, maybe 10% chance per decade that we wipe out. And, and those kind of risks might be considered acceptable if you were thinking like in the old days with a her time horizon of 100 years or 200 years. But if you're thinking on a time, on thinking big, if you're thinking cosmic perspective, thinking billions of years of future, it's of course completely unacceptably reckless. There's no way you're going to last even a million years if you keep playing Russian roulette all the time. And uh, we also have, you know, we've been so obsessed about our planet, but there's just so much opportunity out there, which we could all squander if, if we wipe ourselves out. So D minus, I said. Now, whenever, if I ever do give a low grade. 100% certainty the student is going to come back and ask me to justify it. So let me justify to you why I gave us a D minus by just showing you these pictures. <laughs> so which one of these two people is more famous, Justin Bieber or Vasily Arkhipov? I don't think I need to wait for the answer. But, but, but let me ask you a different question. Which one of these people should we thank for us all being alive here tonight, because he single-handedly stopped the Soviet nuclear attack during the Cuban Missile Crisis. I'll give you only one hint. He's not Canadian, okay? <laughs> and, and to me, you know, this, this is really pretty seriously screwed up priorities, that something as important as preventing a nuclear war is considered so unimportant that we can't, you know, we don't even teach it in our schools. We, we just... Uh, so, so this begs a very interesting question, which we have to answer. Why is it that we humans put so little of our attention and resources to these big questions about the survival of life? I talk in the end of the book about uh, some organizations which actually do put a lot of effort and idealism into trying to reduce these kind of risks. The biggest one of all in the US is probably, and in the world perhaps by funding, is the Union of Concerned Scientists, which is based in which city? Cambridge, Massachusetts, right here, exactly. Super awesome organization. Now, why do we humans put so little resources into these sort of things? The main answer I get is we don't have the money. Economy is tough. It would be nice to, to you know, not wipe, put more resources into these things, but we, we just can't afford it. But I'm kind of a numbers guy. So let's look at these numbers a little bit more carefully. This is how much money they were able to raise last year from people like us to do their, what they're doing. And let's shrink this down. So $20 million represents the few, this, these few pixels up here. And let's look at some other really urgent uh, but things that we spent money on last year. <laughs> uh, cosmetic surgery, 10 billion per year, 500 times more. Air conditioning, and this is actually just air conditioning for US troops, not even for the rest of us, okay? Uh, smoking, <laughs> and don't get me wrong, I'm all for freedom of choice. If, if you want to light up or your friends want to light up, it's fine by me. But as long as you don't come and tell me that we can't afford 
cutting off uh, this much of an area off of the cigarette packet and, and to double the amount of resources we spend on reducing the risk of nuclear war and things like that. And I, I still didn't even manage to fit the biggest budget item from last year onto my slide. It was just too big. So we have to shrink everything down by about a factor of five or so for it to even make room out there. With a good telescope, you can still see that the Union Concerned Scientists there. So this clearly means that money is not the main reason. There's something else going on that, that keeps us from not putting a lot of effort into or in resources into safeguarding our future. Another answer I often get when I ask why we don't care more about or put more effort into, into uh, mi mitigating these risks is that it would be irresponsible for us to spend money on risks that are not proven. You've probably all heard this argument various times. For example, in the forum, it would be irresponsible for us to spend any money on uh, reducing global climate change, which hasn't been proven. And uh, if you think about that logic for a moment, though, I think the easiest way to see the logical flaw in it is just imagine that you're in a store and you're shopping for a stroller for the baby of a really good friend of yours. And the salesman comes up and says, hey, I've got two models for you. I have this model here. It's a very robust stroller. We've sold it for over 10 years, never had any issues about safety reported to us. It's a really solid model, $49.95. But I also have this model for only $39.95. I know there have been a few press reports of it sometimes collapsing and crushing the baby and so on. But I mean, uh, <laughs> seriously, these have never been really substantiated, you know, and, and nobody has ever been able to prove in court that any of these deaths of these babies were actually caused by manufacturing flaws in the stroller. So wouldn't it be irresponsible to spend more, 20% more money on a risk that isn't proven? <laughs> so I think I can infer from your reactions here which stroller you're going to buy for, your, for the baby. But of course, if you feel that it's wrong to say that it's irresponsible not to spend money on risks that aren't proven, uh, if you feel instead that it's irresponsible not to spend money on, on risks unless we can prove that they're not dangerous, if you feel that way when we're talking about the life of one baby, then obviously you're going to feel that way if we're talking about the life of all babies, not to mention all future generations that will ever live on this planet and maybe even beyond. So in summary, when we, when we look to the, towards the future here, we have... We're in a very interesting situation where we've figured out enough technology now that we can go into space, we can do all kinds of amazing things, and we can also do a lot of less amazing things like wiping ourselves out. And we're at this fork in the road where it, we probably can't hover very long on the cosmic time scale and have to sort of figure out which way we're gonna, which, which part, which way we're gonna go with our future. And to summarize everything I've said, I th we humans have discovered again and again that we keep thinking too small. We need to think bigger because we keep underestimating both the size of our cosmos and therefore we keep underestimating our future potential for life. And we also keep underestimating our ability to actually understand and improve the world around us. We keep underestimating our ability to make a difference. So I want to finish by saying to you, let's make a difference. Thank you. So now, we ha it's your turn. We have time for questions. We have the first question right here. <coughs> Would you expect that dark, dark matter and dark energy are convertible one through the other through E equals mc squared? It's a great question. Can we convert dark matter into dark energy through E equals mc squared? Um, we can't answer your question for sure until we know what they are, of course, which we don't. Uh, Einstein said, of course, that, you can, that matter and energy can be interconverted according to this formula. But we still can't convert necessarily everything into everything else just because the amounts of energy match. It's very interesting. If I take a single electron, for example, if I were to just convert that into a big flash of light, I couldn't because energy isn't the only thing that we have to keep track of. There's also, in this case, electric charge, which the electron had and the flash of light didn't. And for similar reasons, it seems like there's something that dark matter has, 
some kind of other sort of charge, maybe to do with supersymmetry, which prevents it from decaying into other forms of energy. And this seems to be the reason why it's still with us after 13.8 billion years. Uh, I, it's, it's, this is a fascinating question because although dark matter has been kicking around as a mystery now since the 1930s, when Fritz Zwicky discovered that clusters or galaxies have much more mass in them, m m causing the galaxies to fly around really fast th than we can see. You might think, oh, it's been around for 80 years. We'll be stuck with this mystery for another 80 years. But we actually now, within the next few years, have some really good shots on goal, I feel, for figuring out what they are. Uh, if it turns out that dark matter is some new kind of particle, which is just very shy and kind of like neutrinos, you know, which when they hit my hand will go right through, out on the other side, hit the ground, go out on the other side. But, but once in a blue moon, we'll still bounce off of an atom. Then we, can, we actually have a good shot at catching them when they fly through detectors that we build here on Earth. So for example, Professor Tali Figueroa and Peter Fisher at MIT are building such detectors together with coll collaborators from around the world. And uh, after many, many years of these experiments being w having way too low sensitivity to have any real chance of detecting dark matter, right around now, you know, they've, they've, it's like Moore's law. They keep getting twice as sensitive, twice as sensitive, twice as sensitive. Right around now, they're really bumping up against the sensitivities that we believe are needed to actually detect these particles. So it's quite possible that you'll have a presentation here, maybe even within a few years, announcing the discovery uh, of dark matter. And if you can, another shot on goal we have is to rather than cast dark matter when it flies through a physics lab, you could produce it at the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva that I mentioned by taking things and crashing them together, not just pure energy, but with enough char uh, of that special kind of charge I mentioned that you can actually make dark matter particles, which would be a sensation. We have a third shot on goal also by looking at other weird kinds of particles coming from space, which could be the smoking gun evidence of this. So I actually think this is a, the most exciting time ever to, to ask these kind of questions and wonder about what dark matter is. Dark energy seems to be a very different kind of beast. Whereas dark matter, you can have a big clump of, and we know, in fact, that our galaxy, with its pizza shape, is swimming in the big cloud of dark matter, causing our stars, like our solar system, our sun, to orbit around the galaxy faster than it would otherwise. Dark energy doesn't clump at all. It just is se seems to be completely uniformly spread out through space, almost as if it were just a property of, of empty space itself. And it just shows up at in, in having a weird sort of anti-gravity effect making um, our universe expand faster and faster. But there again, there are some really cool experiments going on right now, which I'm hopeful are going to tell us a lot more about what these two mysterious substances are. Uh, next question's over here. I have two questions, but I'll be really quick. Uh, one is, why is the ob universe we observe so homogeneous? Um, so if, if, if you think the universe is, is expanding from a tiny point and growing larger, then we should see one part of the globe to be red, another to be blue, because um, things are moving at a, comp at a reasonable speed. Another question is, what do you think about the LIGO project, which is to detect the gravitational waves? Good. Let me ask the se answer the second question first, because that'll be the quickest. What do I think about the LIGO project? I think it's absolutely awesome. So MIT and Caltech, uh, as you know, are collaborating to build, have built these amazing detectors to catch gravitational waves, ripples in the very fabric of space-time as they fly past Earth, ripples which are caused by colliding black holes and uh, other cool things. And the here we have a very good chance of actually detecting these for the first time within the next few years. The, uh, the, the first question you asked about why is it that things look so much the same in all directions of space? is a very deep mystery, which I talk a lot about and ex explain in the fifth chapter of the book. Who is the keeper of our inflated universe out here now? Or has it been deflated during the lecture? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so just to appreciate you know, how, how powerful the question is that you asked, if you plotted this on a more normal color scale, it would all look the same color, but then you peop this wouldn't be as popular. So actually, the color scale has been stretched by a hundred thousand fold. So the parts that are red are like a thousandth of a percent hotter than the parts that are blue here. 
that's how uniform it is, almost exactly the same, which is very hard to understand. If you, if you have some kind of coffee cup that you pour cold milk into and you wait a while, after a while it's all lukewarm, and you're not surprised then that the temperature is the same everywhere, right? So you might think, oh, maybe the universe was just hanging around for a long time and all reached the same temperature. But that explanation actually doesn't work, as Alan Guth, or my colleague at MIT, emphasized, because there was never any time for that. When I, we look in that direction and see the temperature of the plasma over there, right, the light has only reached us now at the halfway point. And from the plasma over there, the light also just reached us at the halfway point. There hasn't even been time at the speed of light for information to go more than halfway. So there's been no time for them to reach the same temperature. And as I explained in the book, the most popular explanation for why it is so uniform is this theory of inflation, which Alan Guth and his friends pioneered, where you actually had a tiny subatomic speck of stuff which did have time to reach the same temperature, more or less. And then it kept doubling and doubling and doubling in rapid succession, creating a vast space much, much larger than, than we can see. This is a very way too brief summary answer I'm giving, I'm getting through in super detail in the book. But it, one of the reasons this is so popular, this theory, is exactly because it's the only good answer we have to your question. Uh, I've, in um, mathematics, we often classify things, and usually if something is not uh, easily fit into that, we call it abnormal, irregular, exceptional, and so forth. Uh, uh, but when you talk about understanding the mathematical structure, perhaps, of the universe as a whole, one answer you might come up with would be a sort of classification scheme, sort of like Lie groups or groups uh, in general. Uh, and then there'd be a second question, though, of why this particular Lie group or this particular uh, uh, object? Are you optimistic uh, that if we could solve the first uh, problem, which would be pretty optimistic in and of itself, that we'd have some hope of further understanding why we have this one rather than another one? You're asking extremely astute questions. In fact, this anticipating exactly what I talk, explore in the very last part of the book. Because, as you say correctly, mathematicians love classifying all the different mathematical structures that are out there. Plato started saying, I want to classify all the platonic solids. He found that there were five of them. The tetrahedron, the cube, the octahedron, the dodecahedron, and the icosahedron, that was it. Nowadays, mathematicians classify much more complicated structures like, as you said, Lie groups, and Calabi-Yau manifolds, and Hilbert space, and blah, blah, et cetera. And, uh, we then, as so mathematicians tend to feel, at least they argue about this, but most mathematicians I know feel that these structures are out there and ha to be discovered and that the only thing they invent is the language with which they describe it. And that's very reminiscent, as you're alluding to, about the way it seems to us when we explore the physical world. We talked about Neptune, right? We don't feel we invent Neptune, but we certainly invented the name Neptune because in Swedish we invented a different one, Neptunus. You know, but we have, so we have the language, but then there are these structures which are out there. So, and when we look closely at nature, the kind of structures we see in nature, like three plus one dimensional pseudo Riemannian manifold and Hilbert space and so on, coincidentally tend to be structures which often the mathematicians had already discovered independently. So that begs this question that in the is, real, is our physical world really one of these mathematical objects? And if it is, why this one, not some other? My superhero, John Wheeler, used to ask about this. You know, if, if uh, like the students I teach at MIT, they like to wear these geeky t-shirts with Maxwell's equations. If, if one day one of the kids here can unify gravitation and quantum mechanics and come up with a theory of everything on a t-shirt that captures everything we know, then why those equations, not others? You, could, if you can even replace the mathematicians by maybe an advanced computer that just makes an atlas of all the different mathematical structures. What about all the other ones? So I actually explore in the book this, uh, this idea of total democracy that actually there is no difference between them. And math, all math, each mathematical structure just corresponds to also a physical universe. Uh, we happen to live in one of them, not the other ones. And uh, this is exactly the level four multiverse, that the most diverse and, and controversial 
of all the different kinds of multiverses that we, people have talked about, it's also the biggest one then. So if string theorists, if my string theory friends here at MIT get, end up depressed because it turns out their theory doesn't describe this, they can be maybe a little bit heartened by the fact that they, maybe they get the Nobel Prize <laughs> somewhere else in the level four multiverse where, <laughs> where I, which it actually did describe. All right, the next question's here. Hi, I had a related epistemological question. Um, are you concerned that given, given the technological advances and now the enormous unfathomable amount of data we're capable of collecting, are you concerned that as scientists, and this applies to all disciplines, we're finding precisely that which we're looking for and the, the potential you know, epistemological problems with that, with the Higgs boson, detection of the Higgs boson being a perfect example of this? Now this, this is an interesting point that you, that you raise. And there have been some books, notably by biologists, saying that mathematics itself is probably just invented, not discovered, where they tend to make these sort of arguments. That, you know, we, we discover what we can, and then we get really excited about that. And, and it doesn't mean anything profound about nature. You don't get that, hear that very much from physicists, though, because I think when you really study physics, it's just so shocking how, again and again, with math, mathematical theories of physics, you get much more out of it than you put into it. That, to me, is really the hallmark of, of this having something to do with nature rather than just something I invented. Uh, of course, if you, if you start taking some random typings by a monkey or something, and you look through enough of it, you'll find a short snippet of Shakespeare there or whatever. And you can, but it, but if, if you look at the first page the monkey typed, and that happens to be the first page of Hamlet, you would be much more impressed. Uh, and it's a little bit like that, with, I think, with a lot of the physics discoveries that we make. You know, Einstein, from thinking about very, very basic phil philosophical ideas about time, came up with this idea that E equals mc squared. And now we have nuclear reactors. You know, that's w we got way more out of that than Einstein ever dreamt of in the beginning. And, and you can say that and the, the, the standard model of particle physics, all the other things we've talked about are like that. People discover, figure, come up with something for some reason, and then they realize that this had wild implications for something else, which we then checked, and it worked. So my guess is that, is that um, really there is something quite mathematical about nature. But you know, this is a controversial topic, and, and I totally respect you know, other views. More questions? Here we have a question right here. Uh, you mentioned about a video game. Uh, the universe looks like a video game or, or, or of some sort. Uh, there was this paper that was, uh, I think it was a recent paper, uh, talking about uh, theorizing the universe is just a simulation. Uh, what, what, what's your idea uh, around this? Oh, great question. So, so first of all, I love the computer game metaphor bec because it really gives it another perspective on how to think about the world as mathematical. So my kids are very into playing Minecraft. And if you imagine in the future that we have some super advanced compu computers that can play, that ha where you can have a game which is so, so much more advanced than Minecraft that it all looks completely realistic. And a character in there is so advanced that he actually feels conscious. Then he's going to feel that he's in a physically real world made out of stuff, right? Even though you know he's just a simulation. If you imagine now that this game character starts to get really curious, like a physicist, and study his game world and see to see what properties it has, he'll eventually figure out, oh my goodness, there are all these pix pixels here and, and everything here ultimately is just described by a bunch of numbers, by these simple mathematical rules, which you know are just a computer program that you wrote, right? Um, then his friends might first say, oh no, you're, you're crazy, this can't be, because this is stuff, right? But you as a programmer know that <laughs> this he figured out the real deal. It was just mathematical. So, so it, this is very much like what it seems like in our world also. Again, all the stuff which feels like stuff, when we drill down to what the actual properties are at a low fundamental level, it seems just like numbers. So m some people have speculated, uh, and Niels Nick Bostrom, Nick Bostrom, a fellow Swede uh, actually, who is, who is a ph philosophy professor in, in uh, Oxford, even wrote this very interesting paper saying maybe we are actually living in a computer simulation. I actually have an argument against that in, in, in chapter 12 in the book. And uh, I can give you just a very brief summary of it. The argument for it is, well, suppose it's possible 
when they build super advanced computers, okay, that can simulate universes that feel like this. And suppose, moreover, that, that there ultimately are going to be much more simulations of you than actual use. Then isn't it more likely that you're one of them than one of the real things? Now, to see the problem with this, imagine that you're one of those simulated views now. He or she feels like, they feel that they're in a universe that feels exactly like this, right? So they can make exactly the same argument and say, oh, in our, in our world, there's going to be these doubly simulated people and I'm more likely to be them. <laughs> and they will in turn convince themselves that they are simulations yet another level down, ad infinitum. So this doesn't feel quite right, does it? And, and as usual in these logical paradoxes where you get this infinite regress of problems, that the, the catch is in the first logical step. So if you want to argue that you're more likely to be a simulation than to be the real deal, because there's somehow more of the simulations, what kind of, then what really matters is of course, if you're the simulated person, you're one, so we're one level down now, right? What really matters is what the laws of physics are, not in your world, because you're just a simulation, but in the world one level ba above you that's simulating you. And you have no clue, we have no clue about that. So, so we have absolutely, if, we're, if we are now simulations, we have no idea what the laws of physics are in the world that we're, that's simulating us, right? It, there's no reason to think that those laws of physics are the ones in the simulated world. Uh, the laws of Minecraft are not the same as the laws of this world. So therefore, I claim that this argument actually doesn't, doesn't work. Um, that doesn't, yeah. So that you can read much more about this in detail in, 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 <laughs> in chapter 12, but this is just a, an example of how, how, um, you know, how fascinating philosophical arguments people have gotten into in recent years. Uh, and and um, I think even though I'm not, I'm betting my money that we're not simulated, I think it's, it is important to keep an open mind because we've discovered again and again that really reality just was a lot weirder than we thought. And <laughs> just one last piece of advice. If you think there's even a puny chance that you're simulated, I have some advice for you. Live a really interesting life so that whoever is simulating you doesn't get bored and decide to <laughs> shut you up. <laughs> okay, I'm pr I promise I'll keep this one short. Um, so it go, you know, Copernicus thought outside the box, all right? Before him, we were at the center, there were these stars moving in circles, and then there were these weird wandery things called planets that were irritating, because yeah, we didn't know, what, you know why they disobeyed the rules. So he looked at things from a whole new perspective, and from a viewpoint that he, we, people couldn't fathom imagining from, you know, th that we're viewing from. Is anybody doing anything similar now, taking what we've known and instead of trying to fill in the blanks and go, well, what's the dark matter doing? What's the cosmological constant you know, responsible for or whatever? Is anybody kind of rethinking the basics and considering that we might be viewing things from this perspective that we couldn't fathom viewing from? Does that make sense? Absolutely. Uh, I, I think uh, it's very important to always look out of the box and, and question everything. I think the single most important idea in science is we should question everything. No matter how powerful some authority is, we should question it. And we should even question the most powerful authority of all, namely our own preconceptions, right? It's in fact, I talk in my book how again and again you had brilliant scientists who failed to make a great discovery because there was one thing that they were really stuck on that they refused to question. Even Einstein, right? Re failed to discover, pr to predict the expanding universe because he had this preconception that of course everything is static and unchanging. And, and um, so you ask a great question about gravity. You know, in ancient Greece, Ptolemy had this cool system where everything is going in circles, around circles called uh, epicycles and it fit the data pretty good, you know. Uh, and then when they measured more carefully, they had to put circles around circles around circles and it got, now we know no, that was just nonsense. They had the long law of gra wrong law of gravity. It's replaced it with Newton's law. It all works great. The planets go in ellipses. So it's very healthy to ask. Could it be that we don't need dark energy or dark matter or some new weird inflation substance, but that we could do all of this if we change the laws of gravity again? I have worked on that. A lot of people have, have put a lot of effort into that, actually, in recent years, which I think is very healthy. Uh, what's happened this time, though, 
which is quite interesting, is it's turned out to be really, really hard to do. And although there are models now where you can get rid of dark matter particles, for example, by having by changing the laws of gravity, we're in this very surprising situation where those models are actually way more complicated than just saying, okay, there's one more particle. Uh, you have to write down a, it's a super complicated math with a bunch of un, must, new parameters that put in by hand and stuff. So we're in a situation we were not really expecting to be, where actually the most conservative Occam's razor simplest assumption is that dark matter is just a, a new kind of particle. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't keep being contrarian and, and always questioning everything. That's the essence of science. All right, last questions over here. Um, on, on the expanding uh, universe question, um, what would happen if they figured out that the galaxies that were the furthest away were drawing the light towards them, causing the redshift by their gravity, as opposed to actually, you know, us seeing a redshift because they were moving faster? That, that's another good question. How do we know that the redshift we're seeing is actually caused by, some, by a Doppler effect, by things moving away, rather than by something else? <laughs> This is something we've looked into in, in great detail. Fortunately, we can also see the effect you're mentioning. If you actually take uh, light and shine it upwards in this room, like this, it actually has a slightly lower frequency at the ceiling than it does here. I was actually talking with David Wineland recently, who just got the Nobel Prize in physics. He put two super accurate atomic clocks. One f was one foot, was three feet above the other. And he can actually measure the time goes slower on the, on the downstairs clock than the upstairs one. And <coughs> but when we, when we so we, we take that effect and we put it into our analysis and, and look at various data, and it turns out that no, and it doesn't actually fit the data in this case. So we, we do seem to be stuck with, um, with the expansion. And, and moreover, what's so cool about this is if you actually say, okay, okay suppose it is expanding, then it makes all these other predictions we can actually check independently, right? As I said in the beginning, if it's expanding, then all the gas gets diluted, so it must have been really hot in the past, for instance. We can look in the past, and we see all this plasma that we've taken photos of now, right? Which wouldn't have been there if it hadn't been so hot. Who's the plasma keeper at the moment? And then if you go even farther back, if it expanded even more, all the gas, before then, it must have been even hotter. Not hot like a plasma, but as hot which is like the surface of the sun, thousands of degrees, but as hot as the core of the sun, millions of degrees. So then you can predict the hydrogen there must have been doing the same kind of stuff in the early universe as it's doing right now in the core of the sun, namely nuclear fusion, converting into helium. This cosmic fusion reactor, you can figure out that it would have switched off after a few minutes because it was too cold, making only 25% helium. Then we go look with telescopes in the sky and see how many percent of the gas out there is helium, and we measure 25%. So that's, that's pretty awesome. So on that uplifting note, I think uh, we need, you said we need to cut it off, right? Yeah. Thank you so much again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This is really fun.